Okay. Welcome, folks, for those who are coming in. Got some people joining the group. Just give it a second. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining. While everyone's getting settled and while we are letting people join, if you want to share where you're coming from in the chat, please feel free to do so. We'll introduce ourselves, the, the panelists, but it'll be great to see where you guys are coming from beyond just the names I'm seeing come up on the screen. Okay, welcome everyone who's just joining. I'll see you once the numbers stop ticking up and then we can get going because I know we have a precious hour of your time and thank you everyone for joining at 4 p.m. on a Tuesday. Today is Tuesday, yes. <laughs> oh, Emily, I'm seeing some messages saying that chat is disabled. Oh, I see that too. Um, Alfred, could you, is there a way we can turn the back on? If not, it's totally fine. We can use the Q&A function for later. This is the only chat-based piece of this presentation. All right. Thanks, Stacey. See that now. All right. It's like we're hovering about the same. So we can get started. Hi, everyone. Thank you much. Thank you so much for joining us today for our um, Adventure Pass Grants Program um, informational webinar. So we're going to be talking, of course, about our Adventure Pass Grants Program that Parks California has developed in partnership with California State Parks. Um, just to give a little run of show of what we're going to be talking about today, we'll be doing some introductions on our end for those of us on the program development team for the the grants program. You'll learn a little bit about Parks California, who we are, what we do, why we exist, and then a bit about the Adventure Pass itself. So if you're not familiar with it, um, get some high level information about the Adventure Pass, the fourth grade um, pass for state parks. And then we'll dive into the grant program, give an overview of the application, um, the criteria, what we're looking to fund highlight some important dates, and then we'll have um, a Q&A session at the end. So if you have questions as they come up, feel free to put them in as a question, and then we'll handle that at the end of the session um, during the Q&A portion. Let me just check. Perfect. And it looks like Alfred did get the chat working. So if you guys want to say where you're from, I see some people have sent it in as a question, but feel free to share, share with us where you're coming from. All right. Thanks so much, Alfred. Okay, so we'll start off with some introductions, um, give you a sense of who we are and uh, why we're here today. So I can start. My name is Emily Henry. I'm the Associate Program, Program Manager with Parks California. I am based out of Sacramento and have been with Parks California for a little over a year. Um, our friend and colleague, Miriam, she is not here today, but she has been a crucial part of this um, development of the grant program, and she is our Director of Community Engagement, and she is based out of San Diego. Uh, Jeff, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hello, everybody. My name is Jeff Kish. I'm the Vice President of Programs for Parks California, and I am based out of Davis. Thanks. Isabel? Hi, I'm Isabel Martin. I'm the Community Engagement Intern. I'm based out of Berkeley. Thanks. And like I said, this program has been developed in partnership with California State Parks. So we have some friends from State Parks here with us today too, have, who have also been a crucial part of developing this grants program. And I'll allow them to introduce themselves. Stacy, would you like to go first? Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Stacy Yankee. I'm the Division Chief with Interpretation and Education. And happy to be here with Parks California. They're a great partner through all of this. So excited about this opportunity to share it with everyone and, and the possibilities that it could bring to increasing access. So welcome. Thanks, Stacy. Andrew, could you introduce yourself? 
Hi, my name is Andrew Shipley. I work in the Park Pass Sales Office um, for Natural Resources uh, for Parks uh, and Recreation. I've been with the office for about five years, um, and I fortunately get to see the, uh, the the first aspect of the Adventure Pass, which is where they get to buy it. So I, <laughs> I, I'm very fortunate I get to be a part of that first step uh, into state parks. So thank you all for being here. Thanks, Andrew and Eduardo. Hey everyone, my name is Eduardo Gonzalez, coming to you from Millerton Lake State Recreation Area, just out of Fresno, one of the 19 participating state parks as a part of the Adventure Pass. So really happy to be a part of this process. Welcome. Yeah, thanks so much. And Eduardo's background is real. He is really outside at Millerton Lake, which I love to point out because it's so cool. And thanks everyone for letting us know where you're coming from. It's great to see you all here today. So first we'll start off talking a bit about Parks California, which Jeff is going to lead. Great, well, it's wonderful to see so many organizations here. It looks like we have 48 participants uh, and you know, to see so many groups that are focused on equitable access and connecting kids to parks is uh, a really great thing. You know, I, have, I had a fourth grader a few years ago and uh, we use the NPS Pass to get into a lot of national parks and really spent the year visiting a lot of those places. But, you know, as we think about state parks, we're also very aware of the fact that not everybody knows about these passes. And it's really critical to raise awareness and help people connect to parks sometimes where they're not currently thinking about these options. And with that in mind, there really is a critical role that can be played by nonprofits and cities in helping make connections. So here at Parks California, we do believe that everyone deserves a world-class park experience in California and that all can benefit from a lifelong connection with nature. Next slide, please. Our organization is about three and a half years old, so still a relatively new organization, um, but we have a very simple mission to help strengthen parks and inspire all to experience these extraordinary places. And we are the statewide nonprofit partner to California State Parks. We were created by the California legislature about four years ago, uh, really with its intention of being an inside nonprofit partner. We use our nonprofit authorities in conjunction with government who does their great government things, and we just do more together. Um, so we have a statutory partnership. And the way that we develop the programs that we work on, we actually sit down with park leadership, identify the priorities, the, the pressing needs across the park system, and that's where we get involved. So this really is intended to be a very strong collaboration between nonprofit and government. Um, but really, if you think about what Parks California is all about, it is partnership. Uh, where we can, we're helping to drive a great partnership ourselves, but also looking at um, partnerships on, this, on the local level between government, business, nonprofit, and communities. A bit on how we work together. So we do try to take a statewide approach. We're looking to get involved in projects that are really across the entire state um, and then drive partnership. Where we can, we really are interested in collaborations between different groups, whether it be cities and nonprofits or parks and nonprofits and a business, but really trying to get this idea of everyone coming together to do more. Um, a key goal really is integrating parks into the communities, right? So how does a park just become something that is uh, known to a community and part of what they're all about? Where we can, we try to illuminate the great success stories that are happening locally. Um, we do a lot of blog posts, we do a lot of sharing, we create videos, really trying to elevate these great things that are happening uh, that perhaps can be brought up to a statewide level so that people can learn. And that's really the last piece about what we're all about is we are trying to pilot. Uh, this is a great example of a pilot program. And where we can, we're helping the department pilot new ideas, drive innovation and new investments and collaboration across the state. So that's just a bit about Parks California. And from here, I'm gonna turn it over to Stacy, who will talk about the Adventure Pass program. So Adventure Pass, uh, hopefully all of you have heard about it. That's what we're here today to really be discussing about possibilities of collaborative efforts of this California State Parks Adventure Pass. The goal of it is really to increase access for fourth graders and their families into 19 of our state parks. So this is a pilot program. Uh, the pilot program began last July uh, when Governor Newsom signed 
and established this program. So this is, uh, since it is a pilot program, it's only 19 state parks. That's one of the biggest questions that we've received uh, from the public is why only 19 parks? Because of that pilot, we're, we're trying to see how it works out uh, and possibilities for the future. So the goal of it is a fourth grader when they start school in September, that's when uh, their pass becomes live September 1st and runs through that fourth grade uh, time period of them being in school all the way through that following summer of August 31st. Uh, the goal really of not only increasing access, but fourth graders learn about uh, the heritage of California or really any state they live in through their fourth grade year. So this is to encourage those fourth graders to come out and take part into their heritage and learn about their natural and cultural resources. And obviously the goal is to support what's taking place in schools uh, out in parks. So that physical well-being, the mental health, um, all of those go in, you know, in connection with the academics that they're learning in school. And this pass, you know, waives the day use fees for uh, the vehicle entry into these 19 parks. Um, a lot of times, I know Jeff, you mentioned like NPS's model, uh, you know, in, in getting fourth graders out on federal lands, their model's slightly different, obviously much more parks. Ours is still in this pilot phase of the 19 parks, but we're very excited. And there has been uh, many uh, applications already, over 18,000 uh, have applied for in and downloaded this, this fourth grade pass. So it's exciting. Next slide, I'm gonna turn it over to Eduardo to talk about these 19 park sites. Thank you, Stacy. Just to kind of reiterate, so yes, we are still in these pilot phases, but these 19 state parks were selected to be diverse, both in geography and in the type of park unit. For example, have parks all the way from way up north in the state, all the way down to the San Diego and bottom of the state and they're everywhere in between. But not also, but also highlighting things such as like state recreation areas, such as Millerton Lake, where I am. Or if fourth graders are really into off-roading, we have OHV parks at Hollister Hills that they can go and explore, giving them new experiences in different places. They can go to see the giant sequoias at Calaveras. They can go to see the redwoods at Handy Woods on Mendocino Coast. So limited yet strong selection giving kids a wide variety of spaces and places to visit in their fourth grade year. All right, thanks Eduardo. So now we're gonna have Andrew could jump in and talk a little bit about um, some tips for accessing that pass. Yeah, so fortunately this pass is entirely online based. So you'll go on Reserve California, whether that's through the main website or by calling the contact center at the number listed on the screen. Um, we do have a option for Spanish speakers as well. And soon we will be uh, um, releasing the Spanish. But yeah, so it's a pass that's emailed to the parent. Are you guys still hearing me okay? Okay, cool, I just saw the message. Um, and yeah, and so basically they'll print it out. It's got a, scan, a scannable barcode. They take it to their park, they scan it in to get their free day use access, and they can go enjoy all of the geological and ecological um, aspects of the park that they're visiting. Um, they can also purchase it in, in limited locations. I call it our designated pass locations. So if you wanted to get it in person, say if you, oh, I've, I just left the house and I, I forgot to go print it out or go and apply for it online, you can go to a designated pass location, which is on um, our website, the California State Parks website um, there. Um, let's see, and I think that's about all that I had for that. 
Yeah, thanks so much. So now we'll transition into talking about the grants program. Um, and thanks so much to our friends at State Parks for giving us that overview of the Adventure Pass. Really exciting to see this pilot program. And hearing that 18,000 number, that was great, Stacey. Great, great tidbit. So yes, the Adventure Pass Grants Program. What is it all about? What are we looking to fund? So we have one overarching goal for this grants program, which as you can see here is we're aiming to support transportation programs and activities needed for fourth graders and their families to explore California state parks. We have four main criteria that we're looking for in terms of applications that qualify for this funding. The first one is, as you know, we kind of talked about fourth graders, but it's fourth graders and their families. So what we're looking, what we're looking for are projects that connect fourth graders and their families to these state parks that are part of the pilot. Our second one is that we're looking for um, an aspect of your program that's going to reduce the transportation barrier to accessing these um, accessing these parks. <clears throat> Third one, so we're looking for those, um, those that you're trying to serve through your programming, that they're communities that may face financial challenges getting to and in, or enjoying parks. And then our last one is that you're providing relevant experiences for that population you're looking to focus on so that it's grounded in um, who they are and what would really be a meaningful experience for them in these parks. In terms of applicants, any public agency, government agency can apply. Um, and also nonprofits, even if you're fiscally sponsored, that's also something that qualifies. So we have a pretty broad range um, of applicant organizations that qualify. While we do have those four main points of criteria, we also have four points of, I guess, preferential criteria. So while we're looking at the applications and scoring them, we'll be looking in these four areas as well that'll really help level your application up above others. The first one is that you're providing participants with multiple meaningful and relevant outdoor experiences. So not just one visit to the park, but that there's multiple opportunities for them to engage with your program and engage with these state parks. The second one is that you have an innovative and or sustainable transportation approach. This can look different for you and it definitely will look different for each population you're looking to serve, but that's something we look at when we're scoring the applications. The third one is that we look for organizations or would love to fund organizations that have an established history engaging and offering programming for those communities you're looking to serve. So you have that built in trust, you have that built in engagement with that community um, in order to, to execute this program next year. And then lastly, the fourth one is we are hoping to not only assess the effectiveness of your programs that you can provide in these parks, but also the impact for the fourth graders and their families. So there, what with one thing we're looking to do is engage a third party evaluator to um, engage with those actual participants of your programming to do a survey, quick evaluation with them and talking about um, what, what that trip meant to them, how it's influenced their relationship to nature, how it's influenced their relationship to state parks, and if they revisited or plan to revisit um, a state park site. Okay. All right. Actually, before I jump back, I'm just going to kind of head a, head a question off at the pass. So um, one question that we often get about um, this grant program is that relating to this first preference point, so that's providing multiple experiences within um, within state parks. So as you obviously just heard, there are 19 parks that are participating in this pilot program. And like with Parks California's other access programs that we have grants for, um, it doesn't have to be just those 19 parks. So while the primary focus is those 19 parks, if you do have like say a tiered approach to getting communities engaged with nature that you started a city park, a county park, something more local to you that levels up or comes back down from that state park experience that can be included in this project same thing for other state parks but just know that more more than half so the majority of the experiences that you're proposing need to be in one or more of those 19 park sites um, if there's any questions about that you know put them in the q a and i'll address it at the end but want to call that out here okay so now I'm going to dive a bit into the actual application and what we're looking for and what we're really hoping for these questions to get. So here are some um, 
questions for directly from the grant application relating to program details. And I'm going to talk about the ones that are in green. So the first one, describe the issues affecting the community's access to state parks and beaches, and what's your organization's prior involvement working with this community? So we want to hear, you know, do you have a, a level of engagement with them already? Are you already established with this community? Again, hitting back to one of those preference, preference areas for funding. Um, being able to demonstrate that you have an established relationship with those you're looking to engage for this program. The second one is stating what approach will you take to create solutions to the issues you described, how you prioritize fourth graders and their families, and what specifically will the participants do on site. So here you have an opportunity to say, you know, here is this this access issue for this community we're looking to focus on through this program, and here's what we're going to do that's going to help mitigate those mitigate those challenges and mitigate those access issues. Also, you know, specifically, this program is for fourth graders and their families, so not field trips, but also some sort of familiar experience tied into your programming. So you can talk about that here, and we'll want to hear, you know, for this program experience, give as much detail as you can in these questions about what they'll actually be doing on site, because that's what we also evaluate too. We look at what are the programs they are offering, what kind of experiences are they going to be doing, so be as specific as you can. The next one is, what are your specific transportation plans for bringing fourth graders and their families to the parks identified? So like, you know, I said earlier, one of the criteria is um, there's a transportation focus. So this is where you have that opportunity to give us a bit of detail about specifically what is the transportation component of your program? Is it you're doing group busing, shuttling, um, helping coordinate rideshare, carpooling, anything like that? So just be as specific with that as possible. And the last one is tell us about the participants program experience and duration. So not, you know, not so high level of what generally are you hoping for them to do, but how long is it going to be? What type of experiences are they going to have offered to them? Um, is it an overnight trip? Is it a day trip? Is it a hike? You know, what as specifically as you can get, um, are they going to be doing once they're visiting these parks? There's also a section of our application that it talks about uh, your project goals, outputs, and outcomes. So here you can see five questions that have been pulled out of the application. I'm going to highlight again the three that are in green. So first for project outputs, what we'll want to know here is how many people are you looking to reach? How many of them are fourth graders? How many of them are you know additional family members or someone accompanying them? What number of park visits are you going to be doing? So if you're doing, you know, this is what will really hit like that multiple experience. How many park visits are you actually going to be um, engaging or, or conducting with your program? We'll also ask other program related events. You know, you have an opportunity to describe if there's other events like community workshops or community meetings that are a part of this program that aren't exactly park visits. You can outline that in this section as well. Next up for participant outcomes, there's an opportunity in the application for you to talk about what are you really hoping to achieve through this program? What are the outcomes? Not really the outputs, but really what change are you looking to um, create through this programming? <clears throat> Here, the way we describe it and the way we describe it in our application is you know, some examples are change in, a in the participant's knowledge, attitude, or behavior that are resulting from your efforts. And something, you know, as an example is so they have an increased appreciation for the outdoors. And then following right up on that, we'll want to hear how are you going to measure these outcomes? So if you have an existing survey or evaluation mechanism that your organization organization uses for access programming, you can give us a bit of detail about how you measure those outcomes and we'll get a sense of, you know, would that story be able to be told to us? Okay, so continuing on, there's a section of the application talking about the population and the geographic community served. So at the top of the application, like I covered, there's an opportunity to describe what are those access barriers to the population you're looking to serve, that community. But here you're really going to talk about who they are and who you're going to be focusing your programming on. So this first one, help us better understand who the program will be serving. Tell us about that population geographic community served. So give us a sense of like really as detailed as you can get as who you're looking to participate in this program. Program. If you're poking, focusing on a specific population, like individuals with disabilities, or veterans, or foster youth, well, maybe probably not veterans, but um, maybe veteran families, uh, that's this is the opportunity where you can give us some insight into who you're looking to serve. The second one, how will you reach the intended audience? What strategies will you employ to increase access for individuals? 
from disadvantaged communities getting to and enjoying parks participate in this program. So there's been some opportunity so far in the application to talk about, you know, who's the community, what is your relationship to them, and this gives us a sense of how are you going to get them to participate. So you can talk a bit here as specific as you can get um, of what you'll actually be doing to conduct outreach and get folks to participate in your program. Third, the last one I'll highlight on this one is, do you involve program participants in the program development process? Something we love to see in all of our grant programs and all the applications is that it's a co-developed experience and program that's being offered to the public or whatever community you're looking to focus on. So here, if you do have some opportunity or you provide opportunity to have that co-development take place, you can outline as much information there as you have. Okay. Now I'm going to jump to attachments. So this is the last piece of the application. So these are the attachments that we'll be looking to hurt each of you to submit with your application. The one that I'm going to highlight here is a letter of acknowledgement. Um, this, you know, talk about it on the next slide about what this is. So this letter of acknowledgement um, is really to help foster that conversation with your organization and the state parks that you're hoping to visit. So what we're asking for each applicant to do is to have a conversation with each park site um, that you're hoping to visit. So for example, if you're if you're based in Southern California and the adventure pass that you're looking to focus on is Silver Strand State Beach. So you would reach out to them through the contact information that's listed on their website if you don't already have an established relationship and have a conversation about what you're hoping to do with the program. They'll then provide a letter of acknowledgement. It's not a letter of support. It's just acknowledging that you've already had this conversation with them and that they know what you're proposing. Really what this will hopefully do is help foster a sense of partnership at the beginning so that you both have an understanding of what is expected of each other. And if you're not already connected to provide programming in their parks or bring people to their parks, this will help start that conversation and hopefully build onto a larger partnership. Um, let's see. And then- Emily, can I, I jump in real quick here and yeah. uh, just mention the fact that if you are thinking about doing a grant and uh, are planning to get a letter of acknowledgement, please do so as soon as you have a general understanding of your project and you're ready mm -hmm. to discuss it. Uh, we find that many organizations will wait until the last week and all be trying to approach the same district superintendent at the same time. And uh, it's just, it works a lot better if we can space those out. Uh, the superintendents are happier with us and they're more willing, I think, to be able to sit down and talk to you about your program in depth. So please do try to reach out to superintendents uh, earlier in the process if possible. And Jeff, I totally agree with you on that. From the state park side, those district superintendents would so appreciate that. So uh, absolutely sooner than later. And in that way too, there can be further discussion with the field staff who might help develop these ideas, you know, that you're coming to the parks with for that type of engagement with these families. So absolutely. Yeah, thanks for that reinforcement. So if you're even not really sure that you are actually going to apply, I do highly recommend we all do that you reach out sooner rather than later. Um, to help start those conversations and find the right person to talk to. Um, if you do have any challenges reaching them, you aren't able to get through, our contact information is on here. You can reach out to me and we'll help try and find a way to connect you with the right person. But the place to start if you don't already have a point of contact in that district or at that park would be on this park specific website. Thanks. Okay. So for those of you who have applied for a grant from Parks California before, you are likely familiar with our online grants portal, but just want to call out that our application is all online. So the way you can find it is if you go to Parks California's website, we have a page specifically for the Adventure Pass Grants Program, and there's an Apply Now button. On there, if you haven't been an applicant before, it's super easy to set up an account. And if you have any issues, my contact information is on that page. So you can reach out to me and I can help you get in there. But something that's so great about this this uh, tool is that you can save and come back to it as many times as you want. If you also want to collaborate with another member of your staff to help fill out the application, there's a way you can do that within the system as well. Again, 
super simple. If you have any issues accessing it, like I said, my contact information is on that landing page, that login page, um, and I can help troubleshoot if anything comes up. Okay, so now we're going to be talking a little bit about some resources and ideas of what you can do in state parks. And I'm going to have Stacy come in and share a little bit first. So I'm assuming that many of you are these partners, these nonprofits, co-ops, you know, that have either been working with state parks or are looking to work with state parks, but are looking for those collaborative opportunities uh, to obviously increase access. We have some established programs already within the department that you may or may not have heard about. And your application for the grant can collectively work with some of these other programs that are already established. And so you just wanna make sure that you're knowledgeable about these other resources already within state parks. So through the Office of Community Involvement, uh, we have FAMCAMP. And this is a possibility for um, large groups to come out and be in a group campsite and have training, have access to uh, equipment and have a different type of experience in a park overnight. Uh, so if you're interested in that, that's definitely something that you can look at. Um, outdoor recreation leadership is, is definitely something where, you know, if you're looking at uh, incorporating this experience about how you can uh, be part of working with state parks or the different types of leadership opportunities or uh, career opportunities within state parks. This is something that also uh, staff in the field have done before, and it brings in different disciplines to talk about what it's like working in state parks. Uh, as well, obviously from Interpretation and Education Division, our PORTS program, which is our distance learning platform, to, it allows uh, to have an experience before you actually might bring these families in, and these fourth graders to a park site where they can do something, uh, have a, a live stream or some type of, of distance engagement to prepare these families before they're actually coming out to a park site or even uh, afterwards to reinforce what they're learning or how they're engaging with that park. Sometimes it helps to kind of calm the nerves of what that experience is going to look like beforehand, before they actually come on site. Obviously, our Junior Ranger program, a very successful program in, in various state parks across the state, helps to encourage uh, those fourth graders with an actual component uh, that they can use then and, and go to other parks afterwards. Uh, Junior Rangers is also has some digital components as well, or virtual Junior Rangers. Our Agents of Discovery is a, a different type of digital platform experience that these families can learn about uh, the state park that they're in while they're there, or once again, before they get to that site as well. And of course, virtual tours, we have lots of digital engagement uh, through the various state parks. So there's 360 degree tours that you can go and actually experience uh, a park before you get on site and learn about it, kind of feel like you're there before you get there. Uh, so there's lots of different resources that are available through our websites uh, that are on um, either its ports or the different park websites to get to some of these digital experiences. Thanks, Stacey. So I'm going to touch on two other resources that we'll provide to um, those individuals that actually are or organizations that are selected for funding. So one is that we will provide a survey tool. So this is what we have done for some of our um, existing grant programs where we will give you a tool that you can use and adapt if you already have a survey tool um, to answer some questions about what the experience was, was, was like and what impact did it have on those participants. Um, Yes, sorry, give me one second. I had to exit out for one second, so I'm coming right back. Okay, 
So that's something we do provide for all of our grantees. And it also helps us get a sense of like common measurable metrics, right? So we're all looking and answering the same questions and we can compare that across the program and evaluate it. The next thing is that for our grantees or grantee cohorts, as I like to call them, we do have some engagement and support we provide to them throughout their programming. So if you're encountering some issues or having some challenges, we can be definitely available to talk through that and try and help troubleshoot as we can with our local contacts for whatever parks you're working at. And then like Jeff talked about earlier in the session, what we're really looking to do is find, find and fund these really great partnership models um, that are helping increase access. And so one of our you know, big components of our grant programs is we offer some peer learning sessions where grantees can learn from each other, learn about um, what's working, what isn't working from them, and then also identify some learning topics that they want to know more about. Um, some examples that we've we've done in the past are um, some DEI focus sessions. And then also, I think one of the recent ones was on um, safety in the outdoors. So just providing a platform and opportunity for grantees to learn from each other and learn about, you know, what makes their program successful and help spread that knowledge. Okay. All right. So now we're going to look at what are our important dates. Now we've gone through this grant program, what we're looking to fund, what the application is going to be, kind of what's next. So our application is live. If you go to our website, like I said, and you hit apply now, the application is live within our system, and you can start working on it as soon as you, as soon as you want to. Um, but something we'll offer, we do offer to everyone who's interested in applying our um, office hours. So if you want to chat with us, it'll be me. If you want to chat with me and see, you know, is your program the right fit or are you having questions about how to answer a specific question you just want to think through how to respond to them to make sure that the information you're conveying is coming through the way that you know we're looking for and we're getting the information we're looking at or we're looking for um please you know take advantage of these office hours you can email me at our grants what email, so grants at parkscalifornia.org, set up a time. We have um, two days saved right now from 12 to 4, where I'll be scheduling those uh, those 15-minute office hours. It's not an hour, 15-minute office hour sessions, I suppose. Um, so it'll be on October 4th and October 21st. Um, if we have more demand than these times, we'll definitely add some more. But just really want to encourage, if you have any questions, if you want to talk through something, we are absolutely here and available to do that. So our applications, they are due at the end of October. So we'll be due October 31st. Then we'll go through our evaluation and internal review process, and then hoping to make funding announcements um, January 16th of next year. Then we'll send out grant agreements, get those signed back to us by the 31st. Oh, I see that's 2022, should be 2023. And then um, the actual grant period will be February 1st through December of next year. So it's a little bit short of a grant period, 11 months, but it does straddle across two um, fourth grade years. So if you wanted to propose some programming that hits the tail end of one fourth grade year and then the beginning of the next, that's definitely an opportunity. Okay. With that, we can open it up for some Q&A. Um, Want to remind folks, we do have an FAQ posted on our website as well. So that web page on the Parks California website, the specific to the Adventure Pass Grants Program, there is an FAQ where we've compiled some common questions we've received so far. Um, happy to still field those questions right here. And then I'm going to tag in my friend Isabel to help moderate some of those questions that have come in. Yeah, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and we'll get to them. There's a mix in the chat in the Q&A, so I'll be pulling from both. But our first question from the chat is, can the cost for junior rangers for fourth graders be paid with this grant? I think that can be extended to all of those additional programs. Yes, yeah, that is a great question. So if there is a cost to that additional programming, those additional resources, if they're available at the parks you're proposing, that absolutely can be covered and included in your project budget. Just again, make sure that your programming you're proposing is going to be targeting um, fourth graders and their families. Uh, but yes, so for even if you're doing fam camp, um, there is a training that organizations have to go through that uh, allows them to use the FAMCAMP resources, that can also be covered too. So it does expand across those different programs. Thanks, Isabel. Yeah, all right. Next question says, we are a DMO that is 501c6. Are they qualified grant? Ah, I don't know what DMO stands for. 
And so I may have to hold that question and then reach back out to you. I think that it probably shows who asked it. So yes, Julie, we can follow up with that question. All right, question about pass usage. Since we don't always have an entrance person, can the pass be used as on the windshield of car? Yes, yes, it can. I know different parks, and if if um, one of the state parks friends wants to jump in, you're more than welcome to, but different parks have different ways they're tracking the pass. So you're correct as that suggestion. If there isn't someone in the entrance station or there isn't an entrance station, using it on your dashboard is um, a way to use it for sure. And they'll come around and check it and track it while you're at the park. All right, so here's a question about the timeline since the outings um, for the past are from September to August. Just how does that work with the grant program? Yeah, so like I said, our grant program um, grant period is February 1st through the end of next calendar year. And the way that the park, the adventure pass works, and Andrew, I'm going to look at you to nod to me if I'm saying this right, it is from September through August. Yes. Okay, so if you're proposing activities within our grant period, what you could do, just if you were to do all one like and every month, for example, I'll just say, throw that out there, you would be able to focus on those fourth graders that are in that active year from now through August of next year. And then um, through, you would, you would shift, right? Because then there's new fourth graders that come in in September. Um, I would say it also would be feasible if you have incoming fourth graders that you're looking to do programming for next summer, that this would then gear them up to use and know about that past starting September. That could work too. Um, but again, you know, it is kind of a little, we're straddling some, some interesting timelines here, but the, the intent with the adventure pass is that it's for a school year. And then our grant program, like I've acknowledged does cover both. So you can approach it a couple different ways. Um, I'll also acknowledge that even though the grant program is from February through December, if you have like three experiences in March, May, and July, that's fine. You don't need to have something in every section of the year. Again, what we're looking for is visits to these parks and then multiple touches. So um, if your program is only February through August, that doesn't disqualify you. Totally works. All right. So we have a couple of questions about collaboration with other nonprofits. So I think I'll group those together. So one question was, will collaboration with other nonprofits make for a stronger application? And then there's another question about, can we include local partnerships like a wildlife rescue program? Yeah, that is a great question that we didn't touch on. So yes, we love to see partnership. Like we've talked about partnership is like identifying, finding and seeing these great partnership models. And you know, we know no organization is doing this in a vacuum just by themselves. So if you have a partnership or an existing collaboration you're leveraging or you're looking to start that you've already reached out and know it would be actionable next year, please yes, detail that out in your application um, and share, you know, how is that partnership going to help you execute this program um, and how does it help you engage this community? Great. So we have a question um, just about the timeline, kind of looking forward. Is there any opportunity in the future that these parks will be expanded? It's probably a question for Stacy. Yep, I can take that one. So uh, at this point, uh, we do not have a timeline for expansion sites. You know, we're still just a year into this three year pilot, we've got two more years to go. Uh, there is possibility, but at this point, it's hard to say, and it would not hit within, obviously, this grant cycle. Uh, so I would say at this point, you know, given what you know of the 19 parks and this particular grant cycle, I think those are the parameters that will have to be uh, worked with. You know, the hope is always that this will expand or possibly become permanent, uh, but we won't know for a little longer than this grant cycle affords us. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Now the question, uh, is there an expected max grant amount and just, yeah, the range that we're expecting? Yeah, that's a great question. So 
What we're visioning right now with what we know, this is the first year we're going to be doing a grant program specific to Adventure Pass. And of course, as we've said many times, it's a pilot. So what we're visioning right now is that grant amounts would be between twenty and $30,000. Um, we have uh, you know, resources to fund these programs. So that is what we're thinking is the average is where it will land if, you know, but please propose a budget that is realistic and actually needed for executing your program. So don't feel like you're thinking 35 and 30 is the cap. It's not really that. Our decision will really be driven by, does it make sense with what you've outlined in your budget and what you've outlined in your program that it seems on par. Um, but right now what we're thinking is 20 to 30, but could change just given given the applications we do receive. Thank you. So we have questions specifically about type of program. They asked, would providing gear to fourth graders and their families be a valid grant pro project? Yeah, I would say it could work. That's something that could be an aspect of your program. We see that in some of our other access grant programs where they do provide gear for participants. I think what we'll definitely want to see for it to actually work within the program is not just providing gear, but you're providing and providing opportunity for an experience to use and learn that learn how to use that gear, learn how to engage with these parks. Um, we definitely see that providing physical gear, whether it's like a backpack, binocular, you know, just things like camping gear helps people um, be more likely to come back to the parks. And so that is something that absolutely can be covered, included in your proposal, included in your project budget. But just make sure there is an aspect of that programming that you are bringing them, you know, you're you're doing something in the parks with them. Uh, but yes, that definitely can be included. All right, we have a couple questions about transportation. So have question, is insurance covered and can we use this grant to cover school bus costs? So to the first one, yes. So insurance can be covered. So any transportation related expenses you have for executing your program can be included. So if it's insurance, mileage, um, maintenance on your vehicle, it, it totally fits if you, if you have your own. Um, in terms of school bus, you know, I'll broaden it. If it's a bus, you, it absolutely can be used for that purpose. The reason I'm broadening it is that when what I, you know, think of initially when you say school bus is that you're taking a field trip for just students. And again, reinforcing this program is to get fourth graders and their families into the park. So not just like a chaperone, like one or two adults or parents, but really there's that um, family focus and component to your program. Um, I don't know about renting a school bus. Maybe people rent school buses for regular trips. So yes, but again, just want to reinforce a field trip wouldn't really fit as the main component of that program. But if you did like a port session before your trip with just the fourth graders, and then there was a family outing to the actual park, that could work. Thank you. So another question about transportation, just broadly, if you could expand a bit on what you mean by innovative transportation of the preferences. Yeah. So we don't have a super fine or detailed criteria of what makes something innovative. Um, I think just in my experience of being at Parks California for a year or so, um, one of the most interesting ones we've seen is people helping coordinate um, like ride shares. So um, allowing people who don't have access to a vehicle and their organization doesn't have access to um, like rent a vehicle for everyone. They want people to be able to meet at a park on their own terms. That is an opportunity or an example. Um, I think really the way we see innovation in transportation approaches across uh, applicants is when we look at the whole application cohort of what are we seeing and is there something that one applicant's doing that we're not really seeing as a trend in the other ones? Um, so there isn't really a fine criteria of what makes something innovative. So just, you know, that won't make you not funded if it's not innovative, but it is something we do look for because, again, we're trying to level up these um, innovations, these ideas of how people are getting folks into parks across the state. Emily, maybe I can also add to that, that yeah. uh, one thing we're really trying to do is create lifelong relationships with nature. So while it's great that we're able to get people out on trips, uh, you know, on when they're guided by a nonprofit, 
what really becomes innovative is when people learn how to give back to the parks themselves. So if they're able to incorporate a type of transportation that perhaps could be duplicated um, either by another group or you know, by the, the participants themselves, that gives a little bit extra points to the application because really, if you think about it, this is about you know getting people to parks, but it's about the experiences they have there that make people want to come back. And so the transportation options that are made available, even if it's just advertising, letting people know about additional options to get back, that's really what we're trying to get to is repeat visits that drive a love of nature and parks. Thanks, Jeff. That's really helpful. All right, back to some questions. Uh, just a broad question. Uh, do you have an estimate of how many grants will be awarded? We do not. In a perfect world, we would love to have a gr uh, grantee per each of the 19 sites. Um, but we don't really have an anticipated number that we're looking to award. Um, again, since we allow folks to really detail the project budget that is realistic and needed for executing the program they're proposing, it's kind of hard to estimate. Um, I will leave it there. <laughs> yes, there's, there's no like minimum number we're looking for, no maximum. It's really gonna depend on the applications that come in um, and how far we're able to stretch the funding we do have available to make grants. Thank you. All right, I wanted to highlight, there's a conversation going on in the chat about accessing guided tours with park rangers. I don't know if you have anything to add to that and how's the best way to coordinate that. So I'll, I'll chime in here. So thank you for the interpretive staff uh, chiming in and answering those chat questions, Cara and Steve. Um, I think you, you pretty much answered it in the chat, but really reach out to the, to the park site that you're interested in attending. Uh, there's interpretive staff in many of these parks and uh, interpretive staff in those districts that can help coordinate and get an experience, a, a relevant, uh, engaging experience for the communities that you're looking to bring as part of your grant. Uh, and, and just to chime back to some of the questions were about, you know, maybe your closest park to your organization or to the communities that you work with is quite a distance. Some of them do have these overnight uh, accommodations or group camping sites. So that's why I mentioned that beforehand, whether it's fam camp or even some of the organizations that you might be able to partner with that are on this webinar have the gear. Um, these are all possibilities. So there's a lot of the interpretive staff that can answer questions. Uh, parks, visitor staff can answer questions too about those group campsites or possibilities. So please just begin that conversation uh, with the park that you're interested in and see what possibilities there are for uh, engagement with our interpretive staff. Thanks, Stacey. I'll also just add, you know, this is really where that letter of acknowledgement plays a crucial role in starting that conversation because if the, the folks on, on the ground in the park know what's possible. So if you tell them what you're trying to achieve, they may have ideas about how you could achieve it or other ideas maybe you haven't thought of or didn't know were resources available to you um, that you could include in your application. Ooh, there's another question here. I'm just gonna chime in about the ATV and motorcycle classes. Uh, we do have one of our 19 sites is an SVRA. And so uh, many of the SVRA sites do offer free classes. So once again, reach out to the SVRA, let them know what you're looking for and see what those possibilities are because we do offer free classes at many of those sites. Thank you, Stacey. All right, there's been a couple of questions on if this presentation will be accessible later. Yes, we are recording this, so it'll be on our website in the next couple of days. All right, some more questions. Um, do we have any idea if there will be um, additional funding next year if this grant will be continued? It's a great question. I think 
depends. I mean, that's the hope, right? We would love to offer a grant program, a grant cycle every year. We don't know at this time if that's something that's going to be um, an option, but definitely something we'd consider if uh, we were able to fund it. All right, have some more questions about specifics for a program. Um, can the grant pay for a, lang a language translator? Yes, absolutely. That is a great question and a great idea. Um, if there are in-language resources or even live in-language translation that is needed to help execute your, execute your program um, and help you know, really reach and break down those barriers for those you're hoping to engage, yes, absolutely. All right, have another question. So is the family getting an adventure pass separate from the grant? So I think a component of what we're looking for each of these programs to have is also helping spread awareness about the Adventure Pass and giving information to those who participate in your programming on how to access it. So it's free to everyone as long as there's every fourth grader. So as long as you're a fourth grader, you could go, if you give you a fourth grader right now, you could go online um, as a parent or guardian and apply and download that pass. Um, so the participation in a grant program or in a, a program or outing funded through this grant program wouldn't make them the only ones available to that pass. That pass is available to any fourth grader um, in California. All right, I think those are all the questions I have at the moment. Okay. A few more minutes, so feel free to ask some more questions. Yeah. Or remind me if I missed one. <laughs> Isabel, there's, just, there's so many repeat questions about the PowerPoint presentation because there's such good content in that. So I know I just saw another one pop in the Q&A about the, the slides again. <laughs> Maybe yeah. remind them where, where they can find that. Yeah, so we will post it on our grant page and then Alfred, who is our friend in the background, um, I believe he can send that out to all of all of you who were here today. And even if you have colleagues who registered and weren't able to attend, we can provide the PDF of the slides um, as well as the recording once it's done processing in a couple of days. Um, and thank you, Isabel, for dropping the link to um, our page in the chat. Yeah, so that page will have the grant portal link and that's where we'll put the recording link as well. Okay, we had a question about Parks California in general. How do we receive funding? Jeff, I'm gonna tap you in here. <laughs> yeah, so Parks California, as I mentioned, is created by the state legislature. Uh, we are intended to be a nonprofit partner to California State Parks. And as such, we are able to receive public funding, but we also uh, do fundraising and receive uh, private funds. So most of our grant programs and most of our programs in general are a mix of both private and public funding. Thank you. Great. So I know we only have a couple minutes left. Um, also just want to remind folks that we have that office hour um, opportunity for anyone who has questions on the 4th and the 21st. You can email grants at parkscalifornia.org. Um, Isabel, would you mind typing that into the chat, just the email, um, to set up a time? If you have a question that can be fielded over email, you can send it that way too. I'll, I check that um, email pretty regularly, so I'll be able to help field your question or set up a time to talk. But if anything else comes up, um, this is not your only opportunity to talk to us. So if you have any just lingering thoughts, something comes to you later, um, we are happy to, to field those questions and help you, help you apply and have a great application. We'd love for all of you to apply. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Okay, yes, yeah, and so offer to acknowledge, he'll send, up a, send out a follow-up email with the recording and the PowerPoint slides. I um, think we haven't had any new questions come in. We're right at five, so thank you, thank you, thank you everyone for um, joining this webinar. And if you think of other folks 
that this could be useful to who may be interested, please pass the information along to them. Feel free to partner um, with others you've met in the chat or that you know of in your communities, but really appreciative of you all spending your time with us today. Thank you, everybody.